Welcome to The Right to Reason. I am your host, Robert Stanley. This is episode 37, still early into January. Kind of feels like everybody's just sliding into 2018, like we're testing the temperature of the hot tub with our toes or something. This feels like the year before the history books record this time with lots of maps with arrows and flags all over them. We're in the uh, factors leading up to the time of destruction. <laughs> but who cares? Because our day is about to be hilarious. No illusions. Known on them streets as the scathing atheist. Noah's streets wouldn't be like thug life, though. It'd be more like like the T-Birds from Greece. <laughs> Not intimidating in the slightest. <laughs> hey, let's start the show. And let me assure you that we are going to take our fight for economic justice, for social justice, for environmental sanity, for a world of peace. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. One aspect of American U.S. life and culture that I think that does deserve respect and admiration is protection of freedom of speech. The U.S. is unique in the world in that respect. You're going to spend your whole life preparing to meet the Lord. Boy, you folks are crazy as hell. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Quoting the Bible is not going to get you anywhere because you haven't demonstrated why anybody should consider the Bible to be true or authoritative. We must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. I'm No Illusions, and you're listening to The Right to Reason. The scathing atheist and I have a great time making fun of Christian movies that talk about masturbation. Feel free to masturbate along with us. Noah's going to tell us about his new show, Citation Needed. We learn his origin story, how he and his wife got fired at the same time just before Christmas. Did he or did he not poop on his boss's desk? We get down to the real facts on the right to reason, people. We report, you decide. Mostly we talk about Trump, though. Last week, we talked to a libertarian, so I thought you guys deserved a break. Without further ado, and for your laughing pleasure, I bring you the scathing atheist. Culture is not your friend. Culture is for other people's convenience and the convenience of various institutions, churches, companies. We very naturally, as a, as a, a cognitive and behavioral imperative, we, we form uh, descriptions of the world and we try to figure out what's going on. Um, if you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works. Bitches. No illusions. Happy to have you on, man. I'm wondering, how many podcasts are you hosting right now? You've got almost all of them, don't you? I, we, that, that's the goal eventually. The way we're going, it's an exponential growth rate we've got going. We figure by 2023, there will be no podcast left that I don't host. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a good, reasonable goal. Yeah, no, it, we're, we're up to four at this point. Uh, we started with The Scathing Atheist. Um, it, it got to the point where there were just way too many political topics that we wanted to talk about that weren't in the atheist sort of uh, uh, milieu. So we, we started the show The Skeptocrat. Give us an opportunity to talk about all of that. Uh, when my good friend Eli Bosnick lost his normal job, we wanted to get him into podcasting, so we started God Awful Movies to give him a place to put his creative energies. That's when he quit doing the exotic dancing. Well, yeah. <laughs> he didn't stop doing that. He just now podcasts <laughs> while he's doing that, in case you've ever wondered why he's so out of breath oh, okay. uh, by the end of the show. And then, of course, uh, most recently, we teamed up with Tom and Cecil over at Cognitive Distance to start our, no our new show, uh, Citation Needed which is just sort of a general knowledge trivia show that we're having a blast with. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. I, f I feel like you left out the uh, god-awful movies. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it was there. It was there. We we, we, we got distracted with the um, uh, with the Eli the, exotic dancing. The image of but... Eli dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So tell us about this new one. Well, so we worked with we worked with Tom and Cecil a number of times in the past. They were one of the first fairly well known podcasts that that whose radars we wound up on. Uh, so very very early in in the scathing atheist history, Tom and Cecil invited uh, invited me on to talk about the show. It was the first kind of boost we got from the atheist community. Uh, we saw 
20 times the downloads uh, uh, on our next episode. And, and so obviously we credit them with a lot of the success that we've had in this world. Uh, we've worked with them a number of times on uh, different shows. We've wound up on the same, you know, guesting on the same uh, podcast at the same time. We were on Incredulous a couple of times. We were on Dogma Debate a couple of times together. So last year we reached out to uh, to them to get involved in a charity deal that we do once a year. Uh, it's a thing we do called Vulgarity for Charity where we'll raise money for secular uh, charities by trading insults for dollars. So you donate $50 to the charity and we will insult someone of your choice. And it just so happens that uh, my co-hosts are spectacularly good at that, as are Tom and Cecil. You know, so we reached out to them. We said, hey, would you like to get involved? They said, oh, my God, this is great. You know, I've, I've, I've waited my whole life for somebody to say, hey, all of these people need insulted and we need help. You know, <laughs> so it's hilarious. I love those. Yeah, well, we, we have so much fun with them, and it's it's just it's such a win win, I think, you know, because like last year we did a fundraiser for this uh, this charity called Modest Needs. It's a great charity. It's a uh, it's a like a crowdfunding charity that does all the work of vetting everyone, make sure all the money goes to their uh, you know to their creditors and whatnot. So y- you can give without the fear that you're getting ripped off, or without the fear that the money's not going to go where it says it's going to go. So great charity. We we had an opportunity to make a lot of people aware of that charity that hadn't heard of it before, both people that wanted to donate to it and people who needed help from that charity. Uh, at the same time, we get to hang out with a couple of our best friends and have a blast and laugh. Uh, you know, everybody gets, uh, you know, gets to have uh, that thing said about their boss that they wish they could say. And uh, and then a lot of people uh, in need make a lot of money. So, you know, obviously it's a it's a great thing all around. And we have so much fun working with Tom and Cecil that by the time Vulgarity for Charity was was over, which and this is like a five, six week thing that we do. By the time it was over, we're like, damn, now we don't get to hang out with uh, Tom and Cecil every week anymore. Uh, so it was pretty much immediately after that that we started talking about how we could uh, how we could get together more often and work together more often. And Citation Needed is what grew out of that. That's awesome. And the first time that you guys were talking about doing this, I was thinking, like, well, how are they going to pull this off, you know, on a podcast? That just doesn't it doesn't make sense. Like, how are you just going to start insulting people when we can't see the people? Mm-hmm. But it's so fucking funny, dude, because, I mean, you'll just be like, all right, we got a photo of a guy. His neck looks like a potato. <laughs> just, like I'm just laughing my ass off the whole time. It's a great idea. Yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you, it, it was it was Eli's idea almost a hundred percent. I've got I've really got to give him a ton of credit on this. It, it started completely organically. Uh, we had a guy uh, come on. I, I, his name's uh, skipping my uh, slipping my mind at the moment, but he was the head of the, and I believe still is the head of the um, Humanist Service Corps. Uh, and he was doing a uh, a bunch of work in Ghana at the time. They were trying to raise money for a group that helped to, to house women that had been accused of witchcraft in Ghana. Apparently, that's a very big problem in, in a lot of parts of Africa where elderly women without family will be accused of witchcraft. And they'll say, oh, that's why the crops have failed. That's why the weather's been bad, whatever. And they'll run this woman out of town. That still happens still in the happens? modern day and to oh devastating amounts. Right? There are these whole little shanty towns – in, in Ghana and in other other African nations where these people have been sort of rehoused. Um, and, of course, the, it's it, it's a town full of elderly women with largely without families. So it's not like they can just, you know, start their own farm, start their own businesses and, and, and make it on their own. Uh, so the uh, Human Service Corps had come in and tried to do some work with some local charities, try to raise some money um, uh, to help these women build stable housing and and. and you know, and rehoused some of them in in other towns where they hadn't been accused of witchcraft, and it was just such a heartbreaking story when he starts telling you about some of these people um, that we're like, okay, well, we want to do whatever we can. And Eli just out of the blue says, yeah, anybody who donates more than fifty dollars, I'll insult them, or and I was like, or somebody else, you know, because not everybody wants themselves <laughs> insulted. Um, and it just you know, and it grew from there. And it, it, apparently, you know, look. I, when when you when you specialize in dick jokes, it's really hard to find a way to turn that into charitable <laughs> work. So when you find that, you you kind of cling to it. You know? <laughs> when you get that niche, you really yeah exactly play it. exactly. It's like we finally found good uses for Lex Luthor's powers in Eli. That is insane about those women in Ghana. Imagine b- that being part of the selling point for your next house. <laughs> it's not that square footage. Or like, oh, it's got a fireplace. Like, you're not going to yeah, get murdered right. here. So right, there's a exactly. plus. Yeah, <laughs> we right. Won't burn there are you. no pitchfork mobs in the area. <laughs> it's a nice neighborhood. Really terrifying. <laughs> but I think if if, any, if nothing else, it just it underscores 
you know, look, because we tend to think of that as, like you said, that still happens. You know, that's that's everyone's first reaction to something like that is like that still happens in the modern world because we tend to think of stuff like that as in the past. That stuff is not in the past. That stuff is right here, right now. And the only thing standing in between us and that is reason and rationality. You know, if you think about it, we're the we're the uh, weird outlier in in history, the, the, the place that doesn't run the old lady out of town for witchcraft through most of human history we did live in that demon haunted world and and it really is it's just mm. this thin veneer of science and rationality that keeps us from there now for you to be doing this as much as you're doing it i mean i i can i can vouch for saying having having one show is busy enough for you to be doing this much you gotta have some pretty big motivation what's your story were you like a, a christian that got picked on a lot or something and then you you let it go or what? Like, what? Everybody can tell that got picked on a lot was somewhere in my history. <laughs> <laughs> that still shows through in my adulthood, I guess. Um, well, no, you know, I was never really a Christian. My, I, I was raised in a Christian family, uh, but my, my parents weren't churchgoers. Um, it was important to my mom that she not indoctrinate her children. She wanted us to make up our own minds about religion. Um, she didn't realize at the time that that just meant she wanted her kids to be atheists, but that that's that's what it was, you know, in practical terms. Um, but so I never really got into Christianity, but I did get really heavily into woo. I got mm. into you know witchcraft and Wicca and well, that's you know, synonyms, but you know, I got into all of that new agey bullshit. I got into hippieism um, it, it, as a religion. Uh, for a number of years. And I felt like I did a lot of damage uh, when I was there, at least to, to my friends, right? Because I, I convinced my friends of a lot of nonsensical shit um, such that even now when I see somebody who I haven't seen in like 15 years, they'll say, hey, man, you know, you were right. I'm still taking that essential oil for my whatever. I'm like, oh, man, God, I did tell you that, didn't I? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Stop doing that, please. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I mean, they listen to me now, but not then me. Then me was an idiot. I have a family member, I hate to cut your story off, but the essential oil thing, I got this family member who gets a tattoo of, uh, of uh, she, her, her tattoo says, I'm his, but the H is like a capital H and his. So it's like, it's like doing like the submissive wife thing, but simultaneously being like, you know, props to Jesus, what's up? But then over top of the I'm his, it's got these, uh, the, it looks like kind of like wheat or something. So I'm like, is that wheat? And she's like, no, it's lavender because of the essential oil, uh, healing properties of it that are mentioned what? in the Bible. And I'm just, I'm what? just like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like you've combined every horrible, you've combined three horrible ideas in one tattoo. <laughs> and how right, did you right. pull this off? <laughs> You've got misogyny, Christianity, and woo all together. Wow. <laughs> it's insane. Anyway, I totally stepped all over your story. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's no that but, but see that's But you exactly needed that. to hear that, Noah. You needed that. Obviously. No, but that but see that's exactly it. It's like I was part of the group that was propagating all of that crap, you know. Right. I was teaching my friends to read tarot cards. I was reading tarot cards for 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 friends knowing that they were going to make life decisions based on my tarot readings. Right? There's a certain amount if you if you are a scrupulous person and you realize what you're doing there, there's a certain amount of guilt that just, you know, lingers after something like that. Um, and it's, so for me, in a lot of ways, what I do now is penance for what I did then. That's so cool. It's like you, you were part of the dark side and then you came, you came over and fought with the Jedis or something. Yeah. I have the same origin story as Tony Stark. I mean, you know, like, I, I don't mean, I don't mean to put a <laughs> too fine a point on it, <laughs> but look, but the other thing is too, is that when we started the scathing atheist, you know, it was a half hour biweekly show, you know, that's how much, that's how much time I could put together. That's how much spare time I had. And from there, you know, our listeners stepped up and supported the show and, and, and it supported us both financially and by, uh, by spreading the word of the show and, 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 you know, passing it around to other people. And over the last five years, it's, it's become a comfortable living. I, 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 I was eventually able to leave my normal day job and everything. And, and I feel like at this point, you know, like I, I'm, I'm duty bound to put out as many shows as I possibly can. I'm duty bound to do this 50, 60 hours a week because I'm getting paid to do something that I would have done and I did do anyway, right? I did do when I wasn't getting paid for it. It's something that I obviously I enjoy enough to do as a hobby and now I make a living at it. So I so I feel like I, I, I almost I overdo it out of a sense of guilt. 
Like, yeah. I shouldn't have a job this fun. I shouldn't get to wake <laughs> up every morning and write dick jokes. I better write the hell out of some dick jokes. <laughs> this has got to be the best dick joke ever. Yeah, exactly. What would the best dick joke be? We're going to find out one of these days. We're <laughs> all we're, we're working for it. And eventually one of us is going to get the perfect dick joke. And it, and then it, it, it is going to be it's probably going to be he's going to copyright it. Well, and, yeah. And, and, like, the, and whenever we say it, we're going to have to say like that person's name afterwards, you know, or something. Yeah, exactly. Something, something, and then you know, Eli no will have to go to the top <laughs> of some mountain and and penis ovia or something like that. And just to try to one up Heath's joke. And it, it'll be it'll be like um. Have you ever seen the Prestige? Yeah. Be an international dick joke war between Heath and Eli, I think. Speaking of movies, man, that's how I first got introduced to you was with uh, God Awful movies. And I was watching, oh, what was it? What was the lawyer movie where it was it was part two? Oh, God's Not Dead 2. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I would recommend anybody that wants to listen to God Awful movies. Get the movie, okay? Find it on Netflix or Redbox or you, you do like the rest of us and just steal it off the internet, what have you, and just get the movie and then load up the podcast and go back and forth. As soon as they start to get a little bit ahead of the last thing you saw in the movie, pause it and then start playing the movie again and then go back. And that's that's how we watch it, the wife and I, and it is hilarious because we'll see the scene and then we'll play you guys and we're like, oh my God, that's exactly what happened or oh, I missed that part or... <laughs> I wanted to say something about it. Right on. I haven't heard of anybody listening to the show like that before, but that seems like about the right way to do it. Um, yeah, I you mean, know, it takes about five hours. but yeah, uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, because our episodes are usually about the length of the movie that we watch. Right, um, right. So much nonsense in these things. But it, see, we, we make an effort because we, we don't want people to have to watch the movie. You know, like so our, our goal when we go in is to make it so that like, OK, you can listen to this episode without having seen the movie. We'll describe the movie to you well enough that you can follow along. Um, but I think there there really is something that you can't translate uh, over to the podcast for people who haven't seen the movie. Like there there are, you know, just certain aspects of the movie that like the ridiculousness of it cannot fully be fathomed just through our description. <laughs> Like, that's your giving back to the community. You're like, look, you don't have to watch God's Not Dead. We'll, that, we'll yep. do that much for you, for Christ's right, sake. Right, that's actually uh, the tagline of our show is we watch these Christian movies so you <laughs> won't have to, yeah. I have to. I have to. Uh, well, okay, what was the one? Did you guys do one on The Shack? Yes, yes, okay. we did. That, we tried to do it with that movie, and we couldn't make it through the movie. So oh. I have to I have to vouch for your your theme at least when it comes to movies that horrible just listen to their show guys don't watch that movie <laughs> oh that, yeah like uh, that one was particularly painful too because it was this so one of the types one of the genres of christian movie that we're seeing more and more of now and these tend to make a lot of money is this sort of the non-denominational christian movie where it's it's very much a christian movie but it avoids all theological subjects and has sort of that wooey everybody gets into heaven attitude yeah yeah like it's slippery enough that there's really nothing you can say against it mm -hmm. because you know we're not we're not picking this verse or that verse Right, right, yeah. yeah, exactly. We we have just general principles like, yeah, Jesus is definitely awesome, definitely walked on water, there's definitely a Holy Ghost, you know, but that's about it. And so, yeah, it's this really anodyne, bleached, not, you know, is, is, is not offensive as they can make it anyway version of Christianity. Um, And it undergirds a lot of the bigger Christian releases over the last 10 years or so, right? Um, I'm trying to remember the one, oh, what was the one about the girl with the cancer that fell in the tree? I've watched so many of these, it's impossible to keep <laughs> the, the titles um Was God straight. also a black lady in that one? There's almost always a magical black lady in virtually every <laughs> movie. But yes, that one, I believe Queen Latifah was the magical black lady in that oh, movie. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That's... If I'm not mistaken, yeah. You say that like jokingly, but even if you saw one of these these Christian propaganda films and Queen Latifah was playing God, it wouldn't even surprise you at this point. I'd assume you'd be like, oh, okay, so that's the way they're going here. <laughs> yeah, yes. No, I should I should be clear on that for anybody who's listening who hasn't watched Christian movies or who hasn't listened to our show is that that is like le legitimately a trope. Yeah, in Dynasty. There's there's almost always there's going to be an African American woman who is almost always poor and has magical powers of some sort, right? Like has some connection to God that white people just don't have. 
<laughs> um, and and that is such a common tra- or or God will appear like in in the shack. God appeared as an elderly black woman, right? Um, and so so there's this sort of um, you know, whatever this this uh, uh, I, I I think I think they're just ripping off the Matrix, but there's this sort sort of um otherization and, <laughs> and ma- like noble savage kind of a, a vestige. Uh, that goes on in the in the script writing for this and 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 yeah I believe if I'm not mistaken the movie I'm thinking of it actually was Queen Latifah who played that role as the um, destitute black woman in Boston who showed the cancer kid how to have a good time even though she had cancer yeah it's just yeah uh, miracles from heaven was the name of the movie now now it's miracles right. okay. from heaven well now yeah. you've spoiled it you know my listeners are all like spoilers come on <laughs> come on we were watching we were planning on watching that. <laughs> I just rented that from Blockbuster. Wait, what? Now it's um, ruined. Yeah, yeah. No, but it was already it was already ruined. But that, it, but that's just yet another perfect example of that, like completely anodyne, non-offensive Christian movie. So that which with, with Catholic or, or Baptist or you know whatever that you go in there, um, you know you're well. The goal is you're not going to find anything offensive in this, of course, if you're Catholic enough or if you're uh, uh, Baptist enough, whatever. Then you're going to be mad that they didn't you know, highlight your form of Christianity above all the others. But, um, Hey, what was the one with the, the firemen and, uh, the, the neighbor gave it to us. I don't know if you guys had done this one. If you have, I got to watch it. Um, is it the one with Kirk Cameron? Yeah. Like he, like he can't quit beating off to porn. Yes. Oh my God. The that's one of my favorite. Gave it to us, and my... it was so funny. Like somehow the wife and I, we, I think, okay, here's the story. All right. We've been married, good, what, 12 years now. Sometimes you fight, right? Sometimes you have a fight. It's normal. It's a healthy part of relationships. So we're sitting there. We're in our garage. We're, 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 I don't remember what it was about. And the neighbor comes over and is like, oh, sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm using a low voice. I don't know why it was, it was our neighbor lady. We're like, oh, it's fine. You know, what's up? We're just, we're just talking loudly, throwing things. It's cool. But anyway, so she, she's like, no, it's, it's all right. Well, I'll come back later. So next time she comes by, she recommends this movie to us. Oh my God. And we had no idea it was about like marital problems. So we're like, <gasps> oh, let's, let's just, I didn't even know it was a Christian movie, right? We're both atheists. So we pop it in. We're like, oh, a movie recommendation. Sure. Why not? Let's, let's, let's see what the rest of the world's watching. Let's see what the neighbor likes, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, we're sitting there chilling, having a beer, whatever. And. It goes on, it's like, wait, is this a Christian movie? Is that is that Kirk Cameron? I know that guy. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, this is about jerking off? Like, I can't, why is he smashing yeah. the computer? <laughs> right, right, yeah. And, and for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, the movie is called Fireproof, by the way. Like, yes, Kirk Fireproof. Cameron gets over uh... his porn addiction by smashing his computer with a baseball bat. <laughs> Because that stops the internet, like in all the, yeah. all the action movies where you smash the screen and you, like, kill the AI. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I, I uh, Eli uh, said of that movie, he's like, that's like overcoming your porn addiction by killing all the porn actresses. You didn't uh. really... You didn't really win in this situation. <laughs> um, yeah, and believe it or not, number one, that is, if I'm not mistaken, still the ninth highest grossing Christian movie of all time. Wow. Yeah, it made a ton of money. Um, two, it was filmed right down the street from where I lived in, in South Georgia. It was filmed in uh, Albany, Georgia. And funnier than The Passion, um, and, which is rare. Oh, yeah, no, it was. And three, <laughs> and, and this I find fascinating. Apparently, this is a movie, Fireproof is a movie that other Christian movies aspire to be like. Right? We watched a Christian movie not too long ago where it was sort of a meta movie where the, they, they were kind of making fun of I, I say they were kind of making fun of Christian movies within a Christian movie. It was sort of a trope movie. And during the movie, the characters watch Fireproof and they're all teary eyed, you know, and they can <laughs> barely hold it together. And, what, and now you saw the movie, so you know how ridiculous that is. But through the rest of the movie, they're talking about how Christian movies should aspire to be like that film. So that is something that's held up in the world of Christian cinema is like, if only we could achieve fire. How do we do this again? How do we get lightning in a bottle once yeah, more? Right. right. <laughs> that was the worst. Um, now oh that was God. actually one that we did before we started God awful movies. That whole podcast started as a segment on the scathing atheist. Uh, so for years we would have Eli come on and review Christian movies whenever they came out, whenever big ones came out in the theaters. 
and uh, and it was it was because of the popularity of that segment that we eventually launched it off onto its as its own show. Uh, but Fireproof, I think, was one of the first ones we did, and that was well, that was still just a segment unscathing. That's so cool. It, it, I, I'm loving this conversation because I've gotten to find out about your origin story like multiple times for each show. You know, so that's kind of right. cool. I didn't know that that's how how the uh, God Awful movies got started. That's so neat. Yeah, it all started with uh, God's Not Dead. I believe it was like episode 70 of Scathing Atheist. That movie came out. Eli was super excited. He was calling <laughs> me up. And he's like, can I come on your show and, and review this movie? I'm like, oh, my God, yes. Oh, please do that. You have and to do was, that, actually. It's not even yeah, an right. option. This is something that must right. happen. You should have you lowballed. You should have come in and said, for 50 bucks, I will. Um, <laughs> but uh, and, and the review he did that for that one, it was so much fun. I was dying laughing the whole time. It was one of the most popular episodes we ever did. So as soon as we got done with that, we're like, okay, let's go find another Christian movie. Let's do that again. So um, was Citation needed, though? Because that's the one that's just starting. That's the one I really want to focus on, even though I, I love me so all these all these others. But with this one in particular, is it is it going to be kind of political? Is it going to be staying in the uh, anti-religious realm or kind of this amalgam of both your shows at the same time or what? Well, you know, it, it's funny. Like part of the reason why we started it and, and chose the theme that we did is that we, you know, we do three shows. Uh, two of them are heavily, heavily atheist themed and one of them is heavily politically um, colored. And, and, we, and we recognize that we have a lot of audience, a lot of people that like tell us it at, when we meet them at conferences or when we uh, uh, communicate with them online that tell us, you know, like, yeah, love your show, love your humor. I have a lot of friends that would really like your show, but they wouldn't listen to an atheist show. You know, not, not even necessarily oh. that they're not atheists, but that they don't care about that issue. Right. 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 Um, so we wanted to start a show that w where we could use the same type of humor uh, without theming it around something that is in itself controversial. So, you know, we're certainly not trying to avoid controversy. We don't avoid expressing political opinions and, and whatnot um, on uh, citation data, but that's not what the show is about. Right. So the show is about we choose a, a different subject every week. We do a well, a, I say a deep dive. We do a, a fairly cursory dive into each subject. Um, and, you know, and we and we and we pepper it with the type of humor that we use on on our other shows and that uh, obviously that Tom and Cecil bring to cognitive dissonance. Um, but we don't necessarily theme it around a skeptical topic or an atheist or political topic. Uh, the way that we tend to on our other shows as sort of a um, as sort of a way to, you know, whatever, get foul mouth grandma into the game. Um, yeah. and, and honestly, it's been fairly successful for that. I know that a, a number of like my friends and family that listen to my show because they feel obligated because they're my friends and family. <laughs> um, they, they all say they like citation needed the best now. So. Cause you keep emailing them over and over with links. They're like, fine, yeah. <laughs> God, we'll go to your well, Patreon. I have to because they, otherwise it's, I have to explain what I do for a living to people. And that's, that's pretty difficult. <laughs> Is it is it ever weird whatever you tell somebody what you do like do you do you ever get like a oh you're an activist kind of like awkwardness kind of thing or is it usually like oh cool like what what are you like a a YouTube guy or what you know like is it usually people interested or do they think it's weird Well it depends on where right so uh, when when we first started doing this so I I was I had been podcasting for about a year um and I lost my job and this was a job, you know, it, it was it was a time when a lot of people were losing their jobs. It was sort of the tail end of the um, the housing crisis. It was a little after that, but but you know, and so losing a job is varying levels of devastating. But when it's a job that you thought you were going to retire from, and it's a job with a company that you helped found, um, it's pretty damn devastating. And uh, it was for me at the time. And the only thing I really had going for me at, at the moment was the podcast. Um, my wife worked for the same company. She lost her job at the same time. Wow. And yeah, it was, a, it was that just sucks. A, it was also right before Christmas. Um, it was it was nice to see the company go under about a year and a half later. Um, once my wife and I weren't around to do all the work anymore, I will say that, that I've never experienced greater Schadenfreude than when I um, when I did the Google Trend search uh, of the company's name and our podcast name and saw that we had we had climbed above them. Uh, as they uh, as they descended further into irrelevance, uh, but awesome. I'm not bitter. I'm, so, <laughs> That's so cool though. Yeah, that but, Christmas um, though there was a, there was no tree. It was it was like the worst Christmas no, ever. It was, oh, it was it truly was because the company told me on Halloween 
that they were going to fire me, but they weren't going to fire me until after the new year. It was a toy company and Christmas was their busy season. So they couldn't afford to lose me over Christmas. Mm. Um, and I think what they kind of wanted was for me to quit before they fired me. So they wouldn't have to pay any unemployment to me or anything like that. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to pay a severance package, which my oh, contract required to pay. But yeah, exactly. I'm like, I don't know. I'll go through the motions for the next two months. Um, but at the time I was living in New York City, which is the most expensive city in, in the U.S. Actually, I think San Francisco may have just edged over it. Um, but it, at least at the time, it was unquestionably the most expensive city to live in in the world or in the country. Um, so we couldn't afford to live there anymore. We moved to this little town in South Georgia where my wife's family lives. Um, you know, and when you're in a situation like that, it's good, good to be around family. But it's also good to be around like $400 a month rent. Um, so we moved down there and – Thus, when I first had to start telling people I do an atheist podcast for a living, I was living in the absolute taint of the Bible Belt. <laughs> the so taint. you can you can imagine it was not there was never a time when somebody said, what do you do for a living? And I said, atheist podcast. And they said, oh, cool, cool. All right. Um, so, you know, it, it, depending on who I was talking to, I would sort of, you know, I do a podcast about, you know, stuff. Um, that was, that's what my, uh, yeah. landlord certainly thought. It's, it's educational. That's what, uh, that's what Dillahoney told me to say. Cause I was like, what do I tell people? He goes, tell them it's an educational production. I'm like, oh, that's genius. Yeah, that's good. That's why you're <laughs> Matt Dillahunty, you beautiful <laughs> chubby man. <laughs> I think we have the word fuck in there too much for ours to fall under the category <laughs> of educational, but, um, so I, yeah, I interrupted. So you're basically in Ghana. And yeah, right. Yeah, you decided exactly. to start an atheist and show. I don't want to be run out for witchcraft. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had been doing the show for about a year at that point, and it had garnered just enough uh, financial support that I figured maybe that and a part-time job in, in in Georgia could could do the trick. But uh, for not for the first time, and certainly not for the last time, our our listeners just overwhelmed us. Uh, with their generosity when when they found out that I'd lost my job and that I was trying to do it for a living, they really stepped up and and within a couple of months um it was relatively easy for me to do that as a as a full time job uh, My wife had to continue to work at a uh a, at a normal job for about another nine months or so before uh eventually she could come on full time with the podcast as well uh It was about the same time that Heath came on full time uh so that when Eli lost his job about uh, a little over a year after I did, I, we could immediately hire him up and, and uh, gobble him up into our podcast, our ever-increasing podcasting empire. So. I kind of want to hear more about this whole thing, like where they they were hoping you'd quit, but they didn't want to fire you. Kind of like, did you get to try to get fired? <laughs> you know? I, okay, so <laughs> they have to they have to ignore the big turd on their desk, like it's not there, even though they know <laughs> you put it there. But they're like, we're not going to fire you, Noah. No. <laughs> They just put a stack of papers on top of it. <laughs> it's a tent. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was um, – that, that's actually a fairly common practice. Uh, I know that when – I can't name the company, um, but when I was – I was a manager for a major uh, uh, chain restaurant, um, and I was instructed in the art of uh, what Dude, they call management. it's just Wendy's. I don't know what you're bragging about. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I just, because of because of deliver a few of their trade secrets that are illegal. I can't name them. <laughs> sure. um, but uh, they 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 instructed me in the art of managing out is what they called it. They're like never fire an employee, manage them out, right? Ugh. Like that sounds them horrible. It, it really is. It's a terrible, terrible, disgusting thing that is manage super them super common. In other words, treat them like shit until yep. they literally can't come in next Monday without killing themselves, and they choose life over this job. That's, exactly. That's that's called facilitation. Good yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was that was the policy. And and again, it's not unique to this company, but the policy is like give them as crap the crappiest hours. When they tell you they need more hours, give them fewer. When they tell you need they need fewer, give them more. Uh, work them with the crappiest people that you have. Give them the the you know make them work on this, during the Super Bowl and over Christmas. You, you know make them work all the shifts nobody wants. Eventually they'll quit, and then there's no chance that we have to pay unemployment or that we get sued for wrongful termination. I had a boss do that. To, well, something something very similar, but uh, we had we were going through this hard time just between he and I for like a good year. And then, you know, over time, we start working well together again, and it seemed like that never happened. And I found out that I look exactly like his son. 
<laughs> and also I oh, found out that, that while he and I seemed to argue about every single managerial decision, because he was upper, I was middle management, and we would argue about every single decision about the production line, that's the time that he was kicking his son out of the house. And it was just so it was right on the nose. And it was long after that, it, we're, we're having lunch together one day. And I asked him, like, so whatever happened with that? He goes, oh, I, w- I actually tried to get you to quit because you were really you were really out there back then. But looks like you came around. And the whole time I'm just like, OK, I'm going to have to murder this guy. And yeah, well, have yeah, to no, murder I, someone in a Denny's. Hey, you know, if, if you're going to murder me, at least let me finish my moons over my hammy. I'll be a happy guy. But it'd be better to murder you before you eat at Denny's. Oh, come that, that would be the Denny's gets it's, people talk so much trash about Denny's. I'm willing to say it. I actually quite like Denny's when it comes to chain restaurants. They actually do a pretty damn good job compared to the other guys. You know who gets more credit than they should is Waffle House. Everybody's like, hey, don't mess with Waffle House. You know, that's my drunk go to. Mm -hmm. It is really horrible. (laughs) It truly is. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. Okay, so Eli, if you listen to our shows, you probably know um, because we make quite a big deal out of it. Eli is the bitchiest eater you can imagine, right? (laughs) So he is he is if if we're going to a restaurant and somebody's sending something back, it's Eli. He's he's a vegan, so I understand that it's really hard for him to in in most restaurants to find stuff that he can eat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which it's his own damn fault. He's a vegan, so I don't have too much sympathy with him uh, for him there. Um, but he's just a really whiny, like, oh, this is four four degrees too warm. This is three degrees too cold. Um, are you sure this is soy milk? Can I go back in the back and watch you pour it out of the container that says soy milk? You know that kind of stuff. Um, and and I can't go to restaurants with him because he always wants to go to these weird fancy ass places that you know when I say do can I get a soda they're like would you like an organic ginger root soda oh, he, uh, he goes to those yeah he goes to those places so we cannot go to restaurants together and then and now Heath's a foodie he'll eat anything he's just happy that there's food Heath is like a dog when it comes to food right <laughs> when it's when he's in a restaurant he's jumping up and down running back and forth chasing his tail he gets he doesn't care. But but Eli always wants to eat at the fanciest, most expensive. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, you have to have your tie tied a little bit bigger. You need no. You need to at least go double Windsor to get into this restaurant. He wants to go to those places. I want to just go to goddamn Denny's. But the one compromise we can hit is Waffle House. For some reason, he loves Waffle House. What? How yeah. is this possible? Right. It's it, it, it's in, in no way fitting with his personality in any other ways. He makes fun of people for shopping at cheap jewelry stores, but this guy loves Waffle House. I don't get it. Waffle House, like you said, it's your late night. I'm drunk. It's on the way. It all tastes like vomit at this point anyway. So, you know, let me go in there and eat bacon. But uh, it, nobody has ever accused Waffle House of being good food. Eli the doesn't even time... drink. <laughs> the last time I ate at Waffle House, I actually cooked it myself because the staff was asleep. That's how <laughs> shitty Waffle House is. I just went back behind there, cooked up my own food, and it was delicious as expected. Well, so now here's the thing that you got to keep in mind about restaurants that people tend to lose track of in the modern day because the marketing really wants you to lose track of it is an egg is a fucking egg. Right. It doesn't matter where you go. They're getting their eggs out of the same chickens, you know. So if you go to a Waffle House where like the cook actually knows what they're doing and they've cleaned up, sure, you're going to get decent food because how hard is it to make bacon and eggs, you know. Um, And and you can go to the fanciest ass restaurant in the world and have a chef who's pissed at his wife that day and not paying attention and he's going to serve you crap. So it's not necessarily about how nice is the restaurant. Uh, you know, we used to have my wife and I when I worked um, a night job for a long time and up till two o'clock or getting off of work at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so I, we ended up eating at Waffle House all the time. It's the only place that was open after I uh, got got off of work. And I would always tip the chef. Right. So everybody knew I was a ridiculously good tipper when I walked in there. The, I would take good care of the waitress and I would take good care of the cook. And man, they made me great food at Waffle House. Right, I could count on a really good meal at Waffle House every time I walked in the door. Um, well, but like the best they can do. I don't know well, if you could say really good, but well, you know it, you're going to get the best they can offer. An, an egg is an egg, you know. So like, yeah, you know, maybe they don't have the fancy French spices and shit that they'd have at Eli's place or whatever. But yeah, you know, they'd get me as as, as good a bacon, eggs, and toast as I would get, you know, making it myself at home or uh, or anything like that. So you know, yeah. yeah. But scrambled eggs isn't supposed to have a band aid in it, Noah. That's the part. <laughs> 
This is the difference. You know, you know what? That, that's the problem. You know, you people like you have too narrow of a view. You're not willing to be adventurous when you eat. The Band-Aid is blue. It's easy Us to high see. society types. You can pick around it. <laughs> Fucking foodies. One guy wants to just eat, like, anything, anywhere. The other person has to eat, like, this weird soy organic shit. Like, the whole time I'm thinking, like, when you guys get back to your house, and if either of them asks to use the bathroom, just say no. <laughs> like, <laughs> doesn't, either way... That's a that's a leave the door closed after you're done with the fan on scenario. Yeah, yeah, no, you got we got to send Eli way out back. How the hell did we get on this conversation? <laughs> well, you tried to talk trash about Denny's, and I had to come to their defense. You wouldn't there. let that happen. Washington Post just today posted a thing of the top ten chain restaurants in in the U S. Uh, and they graded all of them. They had a guy who, who is their food critic actually go out to Denny's and Cracker Barrel and shit. And he ranked uh, Denny's as the number two best chain restaurant in the in the country. So I got I got That's back up here if I need bullshit. <laughs> Come on. Is it, yeah, no. And he ranked uh, Cracker Barrel at number one. So I, I you know, we eat at Cracker Barrel like almost every other Sunday because I live in Texas and it's kind of a law. Mm-hmm. But. I hate Cracker Barrel, but my kids love the shit out of it. See, what I like about Cracker Barrel is they're not even fucking around. They're just like, you know what, whatever you ask for, we're just going to slop so much gravy on it that all you're (laughs) tasting is the gravy. You want the gravy fried gravy because that's what you're going to get. All the things on the menu are gravy fried gravy. Have you ever got the grits there? It's not even like... Like it's just this hard thing, and like, and they bring it in like its own small little bowl, mm-hmm. almost to make it feel like, oh well, you know, I'm such a big person, you know, like I'm holding this little bowl in my giant hand. Look at me, <laughs> and it's just this hard, it's just hard white stuff. I don't even know. It's like a gelatin. Ugh. See, I, I'm from Detroit. I can't. I'd never gotten up the guts to eat grits. Like that's. You've that, never had a grit. I've never had a grit. But think about it. Like you're like. I'm from Detroit. I'm from New York. Like these, these things, like I think of like this, you know, hardened, urbanized kind of like you've, you've been through some stuff, you know, you went through that Christmas without a Christmas tree where you and the wife just cried in the middle of the living room. You've been through some stuff, but you're like, but I didn't eat a grit. Yeah. Like, I didn't go that far. It's never gotten that bad for me. <laughs> you have, you have lived life, but like something that I do every other Sunday, you're like, Oh God, no. What do you? Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> no, my wife's a big grits. My wife grew up in South Georgia and North Florida, so she's a big grits gal. I've I've never been a I've never. That's uh, where I'm from was Georgia. Oh, really? Where where in Georgia? Lots of places, but the large cities that you might recognize would be uh, like Tequila or uh, Macon, Warner Robins. Okay. More more like in the middle. Yeah, we were like well south. South of, of anything interesting and north of anything less interesting than that. Yeah, we were in the <laughs> less interesting uh, portion of this. So we were we were we were mostly in the, like the Waycross, Valdosta, uh, Albany type area. So you're you're the part of the state that we try to keep people from going to. We we, we are the, visit part of the state that the people in Macon and Warner Robins are allowed to make fun of. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing we can make right. fun of. <laughs> So uh, I understand you're a big Trump supporter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to say There's a segue for you. I, I got to say, OK, so this is this is my shameful secret. During the campaign, we started advertising on our show short, shortly after the um, sh- shortly after the presidential campaign really ramped up, um, you know, and as, as most podcasters are aware uh, you know that advertising on podcasts was very, very difficult up until a couple of years ago. So a few, a few fairly, you know, sane uh, companies have, have stepped in and made it a, a lot more uh, effective, a lot more uh, profitable. So we started uh, advertising about right about, like I said, right about the time the campaign started ramping up. And we have two types of ads. We've got the ads that we read within the show, and then we have these these pre-roll ads where they just you know randomly insert ads, or it's not random at all. Actually, it's very targeted. They they insert ads based on. Where you're listening from and what they know of your demographics, how old are you, what gender are you, et cetera. Um, so they, they dry, uh, uh, drop in these dynamic ads at the beginning of, of the show. And we started get and we don't but we don't hear these. Right. We, we don't hear what ads you hear. If I log in, I get the ad for a 40 year old guy in Pennsylvania. Um, you're going to get uh, an ad for the however old you are guy in, in Texas. Well, being from Texas, everything's going to be Smokey and the Bandit theme. Okay, yeah. Like every ad. <laughs> it could be a MasterCard commercial. <laughs> so <laughs> You're going to be doing like the, the CB radio talk. Yeah, right. <laughs> kind of so we get start getting messages from our listeners to Skeptocrats saying, hey, guys, 
did you know there are Donald Trump ads at the beginning of your show? And we did not. Now, of course, part of our deal with our advertising agency what is. The yeah, well, yeah, right, right. He's he's buying ads, podcast ads on liberal podcasts that are all about how stupid he is. Right. Like, <laughs> like, 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 make no mistake. There was never any kind word spoken about Donald Trump on our on our show. Now, and of course, we have the ability to to block any advertiser, right? That's not something we wouldn't we wouldn't have gone into this um, if we didn't, because we obviously we don't want like you know woo and bullshit advertising on our show, and we don't want Donald Trump advertising on it either. Uh, you know, um, it, it, while we're on the subject, so yeah, but it's almost ironically funny now. <laughs> well, it would have been if he'd lost, right? So we we talked uh. to the listeners at the time, and we're like, okay, well, we can pull those ads if you want. I said, but to be perfectly honest with you, I feel really good about taking his money to advertise his candidacy to people who are definitely not going to vote for him. So, like, I feel good about that. If you guys don't mind, I wouldn't mind continuing to take his money. And and the listeners, by and large, were like, yeah, fuck, it. that's, you know, by all means. If you can make a couple of bucks from that guy. <laughs> so you you actually kept doing the Donald Trump ad? Yeah, yeah. We, we, that's we, genius, dude. Yeah, and and like I said, I didn't I, – I felt good about it at the moment, and then he won, and then I'm like, fuck. Like now I feel at least slightly responsible for that. No, no. He, he, basically all you were doing was just taking a couple dollars of cash from – from his administration, just a little bit from well, his campaign, from a, from a little bit of the time. Advertising, yeah, uh, yeah, that's all you were doing because nobody, nobody that listens to your show would be a Trump supporter, right? Or, or you know what? I would think maybe, maybe I was taking Putin's money and I just didn't know it. I mean, you know, let's let's be honest here. Nobody's really <laughs> sure who who they were taking money from in that election. <laughs> the the weird thing about about this whole Trump thing is so many of the people that voted for Obama voted for Trump. And I'm wondering like like if it's not a race thing, right? Then mm-hmm. then what is this? What is going on? And is this somehow like even in our small little microchasm, which is growing, which is growing of of the atheist community, what what are we like like 5 to 10% now of the country that okay. would at least be atheist not not even the non-religious i think non-religious is like what 30 yeah non-religious is about 30 percent if you count in the nuns or spiritual but not religious or i believe in a higher powers i think it's still only like four percent three or four percent that actually identify as atheist okay fair enough fair enough but either way even within our small microchasm we're finding like in this little niche that we've got some dissenters you know like they're they're technically atheists but they're also kind of like this whole Sargon thing, you know what I mean? And and the mythicist Milwaukee thing. And I'm wondering, like, is that kind of an example, like a small personal example for our community of what we're seeing as a whole in America where, you know, you kind of pull back the curtain after eight years of Obama and go, oh, wow, we still have a lot of these people we didn't know we had in this country. There, is there some kind of similarity there, do you think? Well, you know, look, I mean, it, the, obviously, big question. I have a sneaking suspicion that all future historians of America's sole job is going to be trying to figure out what the fuck happened, you know, <laughs> in, in this last election. I think that's going to be an entire field of study. Um, but I think you're, you're kind of hitting on the, on, on the key to it. But I think it's it may be good news. Right. Like, okay, so if you think about it, like no one ever lost power without fighting for it. You know, so Mm. I I like to think that maybe what we're seeing right now is the racism death rattle. Right. You know, that that like now that, you know, after we had a a, a black president for eight years and a good one. Right. Like it's there are some foreign policy things that you can really take issue with. Uh, with Obama, and if you want to go through a nitpick about uh, a lot of his decisions, there were, there were a lot of bad decisions that are, that Obama made. But if you compare him to like all the other presidents that have served in that office in the mod- in modern history, or certainly at least in my lifetime, he's you know head over heels above the rest. He's you know easily easily the best president of my lifetime, probably the best president of the last hundred years. You know, obviously that that'll be a lot easier to judge when we're 50 years out and we can see what the long term. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with lifetime. I don't know about 100 years. I, I, 90 percent, 90 percent, Noah, of of the drone attacks were known to be before the attack. What, am, what I'm arguing this with you. You just got done saying he fucked up sometimes. Yeah, anyway. no, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, it, 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 My and, favorite and that's part why was, was what he's like. We tortured some people. No, he said we tortured some folks. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, look, you know, it, you know again, that's why I'm very clear on the metric I'm using. If I compare Obama to like the president I would want or what I would do in that office, he's shit. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, the, the, he was still beholden to corporate interest. He was certainly beholden to to the the big dollar uh, uh, lawyers. Um, he was certainly, you know, like, you, you know, again, yeah, his his foreign policy record is is is, you know, pretty Lex Luthorian um, when it comes right down to it. But again, <laughs> if you compare him to the other presidents and, and you know, look, I, you know, I say, I say 100 years, um, I, I make a pretty specific cutoff there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going as far back as Woodrow Wilson. So I'm not, you know, I'm not pitting him against any really good presidents. Um, so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not going to, I'm, 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 I'm not putting him on, um, on Mount Rushmore quite yet, but we haven't had a lot of really good presidents in the last hundred years. Um, so, but, but the point being though, that when, you, you know, when that racist element of our society and 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 look, you know, we, we we tend to think of racism as the redneck screaming the N word and, and and waving the Confederate flag. That's not American racism. That's the worst of it, or maybe that's not that's not even the worst right. of it. But it's the most visible American racism. But the but the American racism is the keep the blacks in their own neighborhood. Right? Yeah, but without saying it, and I, I feel like whenever we say. You know, in, in this like Twitter age, or even even if we're having a conversation in person with somebody, and we say, "Hey, that's racism," and they immediately go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm not, I'm not a racist. I'm not one of those kinds of people." And I think they're t when they say that, they're referring to like what you just said, where I, you know, I don't want to join the KKK. I'm not racist like that, but. But That's I just don't want a black guy we're living talking. next door to my house and driving down my home value. That's mm -hmm. American racism, man. Yeah, it's not Roy Moore. I mean, yes, Roy Moore is out there, obviously, um, and and there are those types of racists. But I think the really insidious shit is the, yeah, well, he didn't get the promotion. He's, you know, you know, the old like touch the touch the forearm yeah. method. That that I've I've seen management do that before too. Where it just, you know, you're, you're behind closed doors and they just touch the forearm and everybody's like, okay. Yeah, no, I, I was living in, um, in, uh, a home. I had this very sweet old lady that was my landlady. I was living in the house she was born in and she was such a sweetheart and church going lady and blah, blah, blah. And I just, I don't know why I threw in church going. That's not the, a sign of goodness or anything. <laughs> well, you're, just, you're, you're trying to help us understand who it is. Yeah, exactly. But, she, but she's this very like sweet, we baked you some cookies. She house. wears an apron yeah. when she's in the kitchen. Yeah. Wears an apron and just nothing when she's driving else. around town, you know? Um, <laughs> so you need to wait for her to turn around and pick up the biscuits from the oven. <laughs> Just wait for that moment. Sometimes that's the, you that's the money the, shot. Um. So, but at any rate, so she calls me up one day and she says, "Hey, that house next to you, next door to you, I was thinking about renting that out <laughs> to a black family. Would you have an issue if I rented that house out to a black family?" <laughs> Now, that was like, again, you know, like this is that really happened <laughs> this is, and, and, and not in, you know, I didn't grow up in the 50s. Yes. You know, this happened in, in 1999. This isn't hypothetical. This is a real life story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not 20 years ago. And so, again, that lady, if you had asked her, she would. Of course, I'm not racist. I was renting the house to the black family. Right. I didn't have a problem right. with it. I just wanted to make sure he didn't have a problem. with it. That's the kind of really insidious racism in this country. And those people are starting to lose power now. Right. They were perfectly happy to see the Roy Moores of the world lose power. They were perfectly happy to see the Confederate flag come down because they recognize, yeah, that's just blatant racism and stuff. But the truly insidious racism, that's the stuff that's starting to go now. And I think that what you're seeing with, you know, and I, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus or anything, but I think what you're seeing with sort of this backlash and, and, and the alt-right, uh, you know, white nationalism crap is those people starting to recognize that no even your little insidious behind the scenes racism has to go that's so cool that is a really good point that's that's what we're seeing and and, and kind of encouraging way that you put that there because you you think about all this stuff going on right now and we're like oh boy it's like we're going backwards what's happening but no they're just getting louder just before they're they're, they're wanting to go out with a bang instead of a whimper kind of thing but right. This this means we're winning. Well, 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 right. If you think about it, like when ISIS was doing really well, we didn't see quite as many terror attacks in the West. 
right? When the yeah. when ISIS started getting beaten back, that's when they had to start making noise in in, in England and in, in New York and wherever they could, to, you know, because because they had to like. You know, because their numbers were smaller, they had to exaggerate them with these kind of actions. And I and I think that's a lot of what you're seeing now. Like, I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to throw my brother under the bus, but my brother's one of those people who like, you know, if you if you want to see the pervasive racism of America in action, talk to him about affirmative action or something like that. Right, you, you, right. You, you, you'll you'll hear nothing but completely unjustifiable claims, completely un like, you know, he's, he's thought it through. You know, one sixteenth of the way got where he wanted to go and stopped thinking, and yes. he'll be damned if he's thinking any further about it. No, every everybody in my family is the same way, and it, it, it's almost like they they get to that point. I, I like how you made it like a small percentage, and they stop because it's like as soon as they get that bumper sticker slogan answer, mm-hmm. they they're like, okay, yeah, I'm good. And then you come back against that bumper sticker slogan, you know, which is like a I'm just trying to make America great again, or you know, uh, uh, something about N- NAACP. Why don't we have a you know NAA W-P, white people? Yeah, right. P- right. Or whatever. Yep. <laughs> I don't know the acronym, <laughs> but but it, it, as soon as they you know you you refute that, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa! I'm not racist, you know. And the thing I always like to ask is like, okay, but you're worried about the immigrants, you're worried about the minorities, the black people, the Hispanics. You're worried about these people taking over America. They're like, well, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to. Okay, because you know that once you're a minority, that's a bad thing. They're like, yeah. I'm like, so you're admitting <laughs> to the fact that there's a problem with minorities in America. And they're like, oh. Huh. <laughs> yeah, no, great point. Great point. Yeah, yeah and, and that's just the thing is that, like, you know, they, they they have these little buzzwords that they use to try to get around their own racism, right? So they'll say, you know, I'm not worried about my race. I'm protecting my culture. Well, what is your culture? White oh, culture, right? I mean, you know, like yeah. what culture could you possibly be talking about that you're afraid that the Hispanics are going to steal away from you? Well, that's a good question. Is there is there benefit to culture at all? Because I would think I would think of culture as just a negative all around, like just whatever ethnicity someone is i feel like it is it is uh any kind of allegiance to your culture or any kind of nationalism or anything like that it it, it's interesting to say like oh you know i'm into this or i'm into that when referencing yourself or i come from this kind of you know here's my story but having an allegiance to it Mm -hmm. you know in a way where you are separating yourself from others even if you're black you know what I mean? Even if you're Hispanic, even if you're you're Asian American or or white or what have you, I feel like that that holds us all back. And I think that's something that we can agree. Whenever whenever we we pinpoint it and say exactly like you're saying, you know, well you're trying to defend your whiteness when you say my culture. Mm-hmm. But could we, as dangerous as it might be in this climate, could we could we go a step farther and say potentially anyone doing any race doing that might be. Uh, a problem. Well, I'll tell you what. So I feel like at that point, that's where like I run up against my privilege. So I have always lived in a country where my culture was the same as the dominant culture. So, you know, I'm not Christian, but like the sort of the Christian white culture mm-hmm. that that's my culture. Right. So so the you know, the bucolic Norman Rockwell painting v- version of America is my right. America. That's my childhood. Um, So I don't I don't know if I would agree necessarily just as a blanket statement because I think that there may be value if you are part of a minority that is largely looked down on or that is told that your culture is inferior to the dominant culture. There may be some some psychological and sociological benefits to holding on to that culture, right? Like so, like when you see Puerto Rican Pride Parade um, in New York City, there. There may be a, a, a very significant value, not just for the individuals involved with it, but for the rest of us to be shown that, hey, here's this other culture, and they're as proud of their culture as we are of ours. Oh, I see your point. Yeah, almost because of the fact that they are uh, their, their culture is in the minority, yeah. it needs to be a little bit, uh, dare I say, louder. It needs to be a little bit more on the, the forefront of our attention because otherwise it, it would be lost forever. Or, or we would white... We would do like our white version of it, which would ruin it. Yeah, we, we, we can't let white people take it. <laughs> yeah, we already took all the music. So, 
No, but but so like but but I'm not saying I don't want to say that definitively because again I don't know I I just I recognize that from the perspective of a person who has always grown up you know as as part of the dominant culture um that it's going to be really hard for me to sort of step outside of that um now I do yeah. think that that generally speaking what you're saying is right though right that 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 our affinity for our cultures is is very often just another way in which we otherize and and and, and separate ourselves. Um, and that it is an exaggeration, right? So if you try to take a, a computer and, and divvy up the various cultures, the computer's not going to say, oh, here's Puerto Rican culture and here's German culture and here's Hispanic culture and, and whatnot. It's going to have, you know, these random uh, divisions all over the map that are going to be, you know, more, I would say, probably more regional than racial and, and more associated with um, your your generation, like what, what you know, what what years you uh, went to high school than they are with, you know, where your family lived a hundred years ago or where your ancestors lived a hundred years ago or whatever. Um, so, you know, I do think it's largely a, a social construct, our, our, our perception of culture, especially our perception of culture as being um, specific to various racial groups, various ethnicities, various religions, various regions, et cetera. Um, but, but that's not to say that there's no value in, in, in having it. It's a super complicated Absolutely. question, I guess. The, the whole, I yeah. guess, the whole field of sociology is there trying to answer it. And, and race itself being a social construct, and I, and I think people don't, a lot of people don't realize that we made that. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily like we as in white people, but you know, it just at least like we, we as in, in humanity, we designed race the way that it is. It's not as complicated because people are like, well, okay, but there are genetic differences. It's not just melanin. It's like, well, yeah, but think about it. You know, this person decided to fuck another person that looked like them. They chose to, to segregate based on appearance, even in little ways. And as that keeps happening and we keep advancing in societies and, and cultures start diverging, this thing of race just creates itself in a way. It's a social construct. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, when you're when you're confronted with sort of the genetic argument is that, yes, there are genetic differences, but they're not. You know, there are far more genetic differences that have nothing to do with race, right? So, like the the racial differences between you and, or the genetic differences rather between you and I, uh, may be completely unrelated to the racial differences between you and I. Um, you, you know, now generally speaking, uh, white people are more genetically similar uh, to each other than black people are to each other because black people are more genetically diverse. You know, they, that's we all started black, so there's just there are more genetic variations that wind up at black than there are that wind up at white. But generally yeah. speaking, if you're talking in terms of genetic diversity, race is a very poor predictor of that. Oh, that's a good point. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, you're, that's that's good. Yeah, and I, then the other one of like like how we've all got some Genghis Khan sperm in our yes. history. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> like, I think the whoa. number is like eight out of eight out of nine people. Oh my God! Is that is it really that high? I didn't even know it was that high. I thought it was like fifty fifty or something. It it probably is. I I, I to, to be honest, I I can't remember where I read that number, and it might have been, you know, that that could just know. as well have come from a fucking snap again. Know. So let me let let let's not quote. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it is it is an extraordinarily high amount. The the other one that I love is um. Apparently, and again, this is this. It, I, I, this wasn't a Snapple cap, but I, I, I can't remember <laughs> if I ever heard this from a from a definitive source. But as I understand it, um, all people with blue eyes share a, one, a single common ancestor. Um, that, Whoa. That's a genetic. Um, the, 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 the genetic uh, mutation required for blue eyes is so wacky and crazy that it really is a one in a trillion trillion type thing. Uh, but the one guy who got it. Uh, really got laid for it, um, <laughs> so that such that, that all people with blue eyes so now well. could, could still tr technically trace their. And I believe that somebody somewhere in like Armenia or somewhere like that, that we could all trace ourselves back to this one guy who just had blue eyes and got all the pussy for it. <laughs> when you when you have when you have blue eyes, they'll let you just grab it. It's 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 amazing. <laughs> they'll, they'll just let you do it. It's so crazy. With these recent people, there's three ladies that have just come out talking about their story about how Trump assaulted them, which three is is not even half the number of <laughs> accusations that no, Trump has gotten of sexual think, assault. Yeah. Oh, my God. 17. Where Roy Moore actually got accusations from people younger than 17. So Yeah, right. No, that's true. Well, <laughs> now, it's important that we remember so did Trump. It's it's important that we keep in mind that like before the race, there was a Jane Doe. that was, It was an underage girl that 
had accused Trump of raping her um, that withdrew basically from from, you know, that 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 claim when he was elected president anyway. Right. So we, we, we should keep in mind Whoa, that he was. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, 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 it because there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of evidence and because she was a minor and it was a it was a um, you know, she, she wasn't coming out uh, by name or anything. I don't know. If she's still a minor, but um, but she, she wasn't coming out by name. It sort of dropped off the radar because it was sort of a unevidenced uh, claim. But, you know, in light of everything we know about him and all of the things he said that really seemed like he was talking about fucking his own daughter, um, in light of all of that stuff, I mean, I'm more inclined to believe the girl who said that Donald Trump raped her when she was underage than I am to doubt her. Um, yeah. But I think like, at like that. Like, there's no story that I'm going to be like, OK, I've got your version and I've got Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, so. right. Like it doesn't matter what the story is. Yeah, no, there's no point where you're like, oh, not Donald. He wouldn't have done that. <laughs> but the the thing I thought was interesting was in this latest press release where these these uh, three ladies are talking, and one of them says, "Hey, look, I don't know why anybody is thinking we're lying. Like he said, he does this. You right. heard him out of from his own mouth say he sexually assaults women." And so he wasn't even what's answering the big deal? a do you sexually assault women question. He was just offering it up. Yeah, and what's the one, uh, speaking of uh, uh, underage kids and stuff, where he sees like a, a, a minor and says, I'll be dating her in a few years? Yeah. Could you imagine? Could you imagine looking at a kid that you meet for the first time and that pops in your head? <laughs> I mean, what, why would what, who thinks like that? Well, and aside and from if, just weird sickos. I was gonna say, and if you do think like that, who fucking says it out loud? Exactly. You well, know, I, I tell you who people that that are always because as soon as he said that, you could hear people laughing in the background. And as soon as he said to uh, what was that, the Bush, the Bush yeah, brother Bush or whatever on the yeah. bus, and the, as soon as he said grab by the pussy, what was the, it? Yeah, the Billy Bush on the access. Yeah, Billy Bush. Bush yeah. And as soon as he says, uh, I'm going to grab by the pussy, Billy's just laughing his ass off. And anytime he does this stuff, everybody around him says it's fine. His latest tweet uh, where he's saying, uh, to a sitting senator, oh, she would do anything for the donations. He's obviously making it. And then, and then Sarah Huckabee Sanders says, oh, come on. He's not talking about sex. Well, you know everybody around him covers for him. So if you're in this environment long enough, there's no way you're not going to be a fucking asshole. Yeah. Yeah, you're right that there's no corrective measure from the time he's born to what is he 74 now or whatever. There has never been a corrective measure for him. So, yeah, no, I guess I guess that makes perfect fucking sense. You can say whatever the hell you want. Um, I will say in Billy Bush's defense, it sounds to me like he's like nervously laughing, like, oh, my God, I hope you don't grab me. You know, like, it, it, I, I think I think Billy's been uh, thrown under the bus there, so to speak, um, uh, unfairly, at least a little bit. Um, I mean, let's face it, they did release the tape eventually. Um, but now, you, you know, you, you mentioned the thing with Gillibrand, right, with where, where he tweeted out, oh, she wanted the, the, the donation and she'd do anything for it. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders says, oh, get your minds out of the gutter. That's obviously not what he meant. Well, you know, look, if if Marco Rubio, right, had said of some if, if Marco Rubio had run from president and he had said of some senator, oh, you know, now you're attacking me. But, you know, back uh, if, five years ago when you needed my uh uh, support on this. You begged me for it. You would have done anything for it. Blah, blah, blah. We would not have gone there. We probably would not have thought, oh, Marco Rubio is saying that this this senator would have fucked him. But Trump has made his own goddamn bed in this shit. Right. Like Sarah Huckabee Sanders, like, of course, he's not talking about sex. Well, why wouldn't he be? Like you said, we've heard him admit to sexual assault. Like this is the kind of shit he does. If he had character and integrity, that's not that wouldn't be what we would assume right away. But he has absolutely no integrity. He's belittled women like this his entire fucking life. So obviously that's what you would assume he meant. And also, like, if you look at it, it he's, he's putting begging in quotations and then he's putting uh, would do anything for it in parentheses. I mean, th just the way that he wrote it, it's, it's it's also pretty clear from that regard. But I agree, just his, his horrible character alone, it's totally natural to assume he means the worst. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be careless to assume otherwise, Yeah. given what we know of him at this point. No, I feel like we could talk about Trump forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been doing so it for quite material. a while. There's <laughs> just so much material. He offers new material every week. And, and not to start a new topic, but that's another thing that he does, is where as soon as you're dealing with, 
wait, is he inciting nuclear war? Then he just he just drops some other ridiculous thing, like, get that son of a bitch off the field. And we're like, well, we got to talk about this now. Yeah, it, right. It, otherwise, we're not a responsible voting public, you know, that, that deals with this stuff. But it's just so much. But anyway, thanks so much for your time today, buddy. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, find your podcast, maybe reach out to you, contact you, learn more about you. How can they do it? I'd say check out scathingatheist.com or you find me on Facebook uh, at Scathing Atheist or just look for No Illusions. I'm always looking for more friends. Noah is hilarious. I love that guy. And I don't mean love in the no homo common colloquial sense. I'm actually in love with him in a deep and even psychotic way. I even sent a mail where the words of the notes are like, glued on magazine cutout letters he only did the show out of threat of violence i don't know if you could tell in the tone of his voice he was terrified the entire time i had a lot of fun a special thank you to our patrons phil calderon my humble assault larry wilson gregoria and enema man enema man really all right do your thing enema man music is brought to us by a lost state of mind.com you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash right that's patreon.com forward slash right learn more about the production at the right to reason.com. Next week, we will be talking to Callie Wright of the Gaytheist Manifesto. Know that between now and then, you have the right to reason. Mm-hmm.